Good morning. Today we are discussing superior mesenteric artery occlusion, more commonly referred to as SMA occlusion. This condition represents one of the most formidable challenges in acute care medicine and vascular surgery. It is a diagnosis where the clinician's index of suspicion is the most critical tool in the diagnostic arsenal. SMA occlusion is a true time is tissue emergency, much like a myocardial infarction or a stroke, but involving the visceral circulation. When the blood supply to the mesenteric bed is compromised, the clock begins ticking toward irreversible transmural bowel necrosis, sepsis, and multi-organ failure. The epidemiology of SMA occlusion is closely tied to the aging population and the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. While it accounts for only about 1% of all acute abdominal presentations, its mortality rate is disproportionately high. Even with advancements in imaging and endovascular techniques, the global mortality remains between 30 and 60%. This high mortality is often attributed to the diagnostic delay. Because the early physical exam is often deceptively normal, patients are frequently misdiagnosed with gastroenteritis or biliary colic until the bowel has already infarcted. We see a slight female predominance, and the vast majority of patients are over the age of 65 with coexisting atrial fibrillation or advanced atherosclerosis. To understand the management, we must distinguish between the two primary mechanisms of occlusion. The most common is an embolic event. In these cases, a clot typically originates in the left atrium, often due to atrial fibrillation, and travels distally until it wedges in the SMA. Interestingly, because of the takeoff angle of the SMA from the aorta, emboli usually lodge 6 to 10 centimeters distal to the origin, often past the point where the middle colic artery branches off. This may spare the very proximal portion of the jejunum. In contrast, SMA thrombosis occurs in patients with pre-existing atherosclerotic disease. These patients often have a history of intestinal angina, postprandial pain, and weight loss. The acute event occurs when a plaque at the very origin of the SMA ruptures, leading to complete occlusion. Because the occlusion is at the origin, the entire distribution of the SMA is at risk, often leading to more extensive bowel loss than an embolic event. Consider a 72-year-old male with a history of hypertension and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who presents to the emergency department with the sudden onset of generalized, agonizing abdominal pain. He describes the pain as a 10 out of 10. On your examination, however, his abdomen is soft and non-tender. There is no guarding and no rebound. This discrepancy, pain that is far worse than what your hands can elicit on exam, is the hallmark of early SMA occlusion. This is the golden window where the bowel is ischemic but still viable. If you wait until the patient develops a rigid abdomen or bloody stools, you are no longer treating ischemia, you are treating gangrene. In the laboratory workup, we often look for an elevated serum lactate. However, I must emphasize that a normal lactate does not rule out early ischemia. Lactate only rises significantly once cellular death and anaerobic metabolism are widespread. The most helpful laboratory test for exclusion is the D-dimer. A low D-dimer has a very high negative predictive value for mesenteric ischemia. The gold standard for diagnosis is the Computed Tomography Angiography, or CTA. It is imperative that the requisition specifies CTA with mesenteric protocol, which includes an arterial phase. A standard CT of the abdomen with oral contrast is often insufficient and may actually obscure the vascular anatomy. On a CTA, we look for a filling defect in the SMA, a lack of bowel wall enhancement, and in late stages, pneumatosis intestinalis, which is gas within the bowel wall. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, management must be swift. The patient should be started on a weight-based heparin infusion immediately to prevent further clot propagation. Aggressive fluid resuscitation is necessary because ischemic bowel third spaces massive amounts of fluid. The choice between open surgery and endovascular therapy depends on the stability of the patient and the presence of peritonitis. If the patient has signs of a surgical abdomen, they must go straight to the operating room.
For an embolic occlusion, an open embolectomy using a Fogarty catheter is the classic approach. If the bowel appears dusky, we must decide whether it is salvageable. A key pearl in mesenteric surgery is the second look laparotomy. We revascularize the gut, wait 24 hours, and then return to the operating room to definitively resect any tissue that did not recover. In stable patients without peritonitis, endovascular options like mechanical thrombectomy or stenting are increasingly used. These techniques are less invasive and can be life-saving in patients who are poor surgical candidates. The prognosis is entirely dependent on the interval between the onset of pain and the restoration of blood flow. If revascularization occurs within 6 to 12 hours, the chances of survival and bowel salvage are excellent. Beyond 24 hours, the mortality rate approaches 80%. For survivors, the primary concern is short gut syndrome if extensive resection was required. These patients may require long-term parenteral nutrition. Furthermore, identifying and treating the source of the occlusion, such as anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation or antiplatelet therapy for atherosclerosis, is vital to prevent recurrence. Thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions.